Durham Bulls podcast, the authoritative, authentic podcast of everything Durham Bulls. It's the stars, it's the stories, it's the history, it's our tradition, the people, the mascot, the movie. If it's Durham Bulls, it's here. I'm Patrick Keenis, the TV radio broadcaster for the Durham Bulls. So settle in and enjoy today's show because we just have yet another International League and Durham Bulls uh, Hall of Fame manager whose number hangs on our wall just outside of my office. He won two Governor's Cups back-to-back. You know who it is, right? So before we introduce our guest, though, a quick reminder, you can find the Durham Bulls podcast on Spotify and on Apple. You can subscribe there and don't miss a show. We're also videoing these podcasts as well. So check out our the Durham Bulls podcast, a YouTube channel. Subscribe to that, and you'll get notifications every week as we sit down with uh, all, of, all of the great family members, the people who make up uh, the great tradition of the Durham Bulls. So let's get to it. He has 613 wins as the Durham Bulls manager, International League Hall of Fame member, 1,381 total minor league wins as a manager, and I believe an 800 winning percentage as a big league manager. He's also a husband of 42 years, I believe. It's Bill Evers. Hi, Bill. Hey, Patrick. How are you? Were my stats correct? Did I screw anything up? Um, I believe so, without a doubt. <laughs> it was a great career. Well, thank you. And and, and we're, we're so fortunate to have intersected uh, with you here with Durham. First of all, kind of give the fans an idea what what you're doing now, because it's it's so odd to think of you no longer active in the game, but you retired from baseball a couple of years ago. Well, I retired after the season of 21. Um, I thought that was enough time and uh, I wanted to spend some time with my family. So uh, two years prior to that, I built a house with my son and two grandkids and my daughter lives within 35 minutes of us. She has three, so we have five total. I'm not really retired yet from the coaching <laughs> ranks as my nine-year-old is, and my son have a little league team. So I'm helping coach that to keep myself uh, busy with nine and 10-year-olds, <laughs> which uh, has been uh, really great. Uh, I've been doing that for the last two years. So seeing the growth of those kids uh, is really rewarding. Walk me through what that is like, because over your career, and we'll dive into the details a little bit later, but You've managed many Hall of Famers, All Stars, uh, World <laughs> Champions, and now you're you're helping to coach eight, nine, and ten year old kids. What what is that like for you in terms of the demands and the expectations that you have of playing the game the right way? Well, the demands is I've learned patience, 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 <laughs> um, but it's very rewarding, and you see them grow from one game to the next game, um, from one year to the next. Um, and we've been fortunate to have some good kids with great parents in a little league atmosphere where they're not screaming and hollering at us. And we're able to help the kids uh, get better and to learn the game of baseball and have fun at it. But the main thing is when we have practice, we have practice to not in, to enjoy the game and have fun at it, mm-hmm. but to learn how to play it the right way. And so are you, are you kind of, um, using Rays, Twins, you know, Yankee, Giant procedures, uh, things that you've done in, you know, over, over your professional career and just kind of taking it down to an elementary level for these kids? Or what, what, is, what is a practice structure like for these kids that, <clears throat> that you're helping to run? Well, we teach them the, the basics of baseball and how to hold a baseball the correct way to throw it because their hands are so small. We actually, Mm -hmm. rather than with two fingers on top of the ball, we have the three fingers so they can control the ball better. Uh, We teach them the correct way to catch the baseball. Uh, But the most thing they really like to do is to hit. So we (laughs) allow them to do what they like to do. But over the course of the last two years where we've had the same kids we, we've been able to incorporate some uh, proper swings with balance and things like that. And mm-hmm. to take away from the drop and lift method of swinging for home runs that they see on ESPN all the mm-hmm. time, uh, we try to make them hit line drives and to hit, make yeah. solid contact. Now, I know when I played baseball in, in Little League and back in Illinois, that would have been seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old in that range. E- even if somebody 
of, of your stature had come through and offered to help and been part of the coaching staff, I'm not sure I w really would have been aware what it would have meant to have somebody working with me and my friends playing who spent 40 plus years working in professional baseball and a lot of those years at the high levels of the minors or major league baseball. Do, do they have any idea about the background and the, and the players uh, with whom you've, you've helped develop? Well, the, the only impact I have is through the parents and the mm -hmm. parents tell the kids, the kids have no idea of, of the instruction they're getting or anything like that. So it's a delicate balance that um, I have in, in how I present it to the guy, to the kids in that, um, you know, it takes a little while for them to understand. Mm -hmm. And um, with myself and my son, uh, the patience has really gotten a lot better and <laughs> the kids are having more fun and they're, you know, they're enjoying themselves. And that's the basic thing. We're trying to incorporate fun as well as how to play the game. And hopefully someday they can, they can go on and play in high school and college and, you know, maybe be that 1% to get to the yeah. minor leagues and to the big leagues. Is it, is it, is it fun for you? I mean, is, I'm sure pro baseball, big league baseball, that's a different kind of fun, but that's a job. There's pressure, there's stress. It never <clears> ends. <throat> and it goes, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year. But what, what, what is it, what does this feel like just to kind of be part of the game in a much, much different and more relaxing way? Well, it, it's a lot different in that the enthusiasm that the little guys they always want to know what the score is. And if they're losing, they drop their head. And our job is to pick them up and make them understand mm -hmm. that winning at this level is not the greatest thing. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, giving your best every day. But th the score really matters to to them. At, yeah. and, at, and they started at age seven when I started coaching. So they want to know what the score is and how they're doing. And, and winning mm -hmm. is still very very important to them but um basically what we do is we try to incorporate where at the end of the game we always have a game ball given to one of the players and they look forward to that and you make one kid happy and there's probably four or five that are not so happy but that's the the nature of the beast but uh everybody gets a game ball within the course of the year uh, when you play 16 or 18 games and you only have 10 kids. So you're, you're not sitting anybody, everybody gets to play, everybody gets to hit. So um, they've really grown in from T-ball to machine pitch to coach pitch. And now they're starting to pitch at age nine uh, full time for the game. So, uh, you know, it's fun to watch the growth of, of them. And, and so selfishly, I have a two-year-old son, so I'm just kind of forecasting him in this position and me in this position in a few years, and it just sounds it just sounds awesome to me. Uh, but we'll, we'll oh, talk. It is. <laughs> no, please. It it's really awesome to see their growth and how quick they they respond to the successes they have and how they handle you know striking out and you know moping on the bench and how they've grown from one, one season to the next. Um, and, you know, we incorporate with the parents to help in their positive attitudes and things like that, and not scream at them during the game. <laughs> and we've been fortunate to have good parents that understand that the game is fun and we want the kids to have fun. Well, as long as you have worked in pro baseball and you bring up teaching <laughs> fundamentals to these young, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old impressionable kids, uh, just I'll throw some random questions out there. Wh which player, if you can recall one, came to you at the lower levels of the minor leagues, whether you're in Clinton or in Greensboro or somewhere else, that was more fundamentally sound than anybody else? Was there one that sticks out in your head? Um, that's hard to say in that um, who was the best fundamentally at, at such a young age, but I've had some really good 18 year old kids coming out of high school, um, you know, so, and to signal out one guy, is, it would be unfair to the other guys, <laughs> but you know, when you had Rocco and, and CC, Carlos uh, mm -hmm. Crawford, Carl Crawford, 
And, you know, and you had Derek G. I had fortunate to have Derek Cheater and, and people like that. So I've had some really good players that have made me a really good manager. Yeah. Let's talk about Durham for a little while, and then we'll kind of get in. I, I do want to get into that history and all the great uh, players that that have benefited from from your knowledge and your ability and your teachings. But uh, what 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 was Durham like? So you were the first Durham Bulls manager as the Bulls became a Triple A franchise in, uh, in in 1998. What, Everything was brand new as far as the Rays were concerned. The franchise, developing players, bringing everybody in. You know, Mitch Lukovic and several others were there from day one. You were basically right there with them. What, what was it like back then as the Rays were trying to put together their first AAA team and chose you as the person to lead it? Well, I think I was fortunate in that um, when we started up, I was one of the first. Uh, I think I was the second hire. Uh, right after Tom Foley and then Mitch came along and, and Bill Livesey and it, we were fortunate that Chuck Lamar, uh, you know, hired us to help uh, develop these players. Um, I had some experience at a AAA level mm -hmm. and then got let go by the Yankees. And fortunately, Chuck and Bill Livesey decided that uh, I was the, I was the guy that was going to take the kids the first year to to the Gulf Coast League, and then from the Gulf Coast League to the Florida State League. And then when we had the AAA job open up in Durham, I was promised that, and that that transpired. So, um, But the growth of the Durham Bulls at a AAA level is unheard of. To how um, it's gone from, well, Matt West helped, really helped lay the foundation with Mike Burling. Mm -hmm. Mike Burling was the assistant to, to Matt West originally. And then Mike took over when Matt decided to go in a different direction. But Mike Burling has done a, an outstanding job of melding um, different managers, different philosophies, different personalities, um, and made things he was given the opportunity by Mr. Goodman to make things at a triple A level to where guys felt comfortable to come to Durham and, and succeed. The fans in Durham are just incredible how they support everybody. Um, if you go to a Durham Bulls game, you, you hardly ever hear a booing. Um, and the only time I really heard booing was when, um, Jose Guillen was on a rehab and broke his bat and didn't run to first. And that was the first time I heard that. But after that, I, I mean, they, they are just the greatest fans yeah. in minor league baseball and in major league baseball that I've come across. And and you've been to Durham many times since, since you left as the manager back in, you know, after your, after your time here with the bulls in, in 2005, could you have forecast not just the fans, but just the the growth and the development and the evolution of the Durham neighborhood, the Durham community in, in terms of what it is now versus what was it like that day in April of 1998? Well, it was an infancy. You know, it was the it was the start of something that's bigger and broader right now that you can't imagine how how it's grown but you know um having alongside it in the street you have all the shops and everything and how that's grown and then over left field now the hotel there and, and just all the buildings and stuff it, it's just really incredible how it's grown <clears throat> excuse me but it Mr. Goodman has done such a wonderful job in developing yeah. and making that a fun place for, for the people of Durham and the surrounding areas to come watch a game. And, and the Rays have really done a nice job in putting players in there that compete year in and mm -hmm. year out. And they may be spoiled in Durham, but, <laughs> you know, they've had some great teams and yeah. they're, it's very fortunate that uh, they are able to succeed year in and year out. Yeah, one question I get a lot from fans when they just because the Bulls have not only developed Durham Bulls fans, but by association and almost by by family, a lot of Tampa Bay Rays fans in this area as a result because they are so connected to the team, they get so involved and kind of intimate with the players on a game by game basis. 
you, as you mentioned earlier, you've been with the race since day one. So that means that you experienced a lot of those lean years and now it's lean no more as far as what the Rays have been able to do and sustain uh, with the budget kind of constraints that they have. Where, where, where did that begin to change for you from the, the, the devil rays that were perennial, you know, bottom dwellers within the American league East to becoming a, not just a contending team on a whim one year, but doing it for a sustained amount of time, because it's a process. It, it, it was, it was, there was nothing flukish about what the Rays' plan was, but you saw this in the lab. So where, where did it begin? Where did you really believe, you know, we're onto something here. This is, this is going to work. Well, I believe that it started from the beginning in that in, in the player development side, we incorporated, um, you know, through Mitch Lukovic and, and Chuck Lamar and Tom Foley that, um, we want to develop the players so that, that when they get to the big leagues, they can make an impact. So in doing that, we, we brought in some older, older players to surround those younger guys with um, when they were in the minor leagues to, to learn how to play the game. And the managers were well aware of what was going on and the process of how they needed to develop. Every player within our minor leagues had their own specific player development program that was written out and the kids sat down with us as a manager and knew what their program was. So there was no, no hiding anything. Everybody knew what was expected of them and how to, how to go about that business and that it was going to take time. And we gave them the time and the ability to succeed as well as fail and how they failed was going to make them a better player in the long run, which was hard to uh, incorporate with them as nobody likes failing. Um, so um, with that player development program for each player, um, I think they understood where they stood within the organization and how they were going to move. Now, on the converse to that, and nowadays it's more rushing for me personally guys getting to the big leagues quicker and learning while they're up there, um, which, which is okay. Um, but for me, I think they can make an impact quicker once they get up there, as opposed to more, more at bats, more innings pitched um, at a minor league level. So can you, can you juxtapose that Rays philosophy that you just laid out not necessarily against other organizations, but I'm talking like when you broke in as the manager of the Clinton Giants in 1987. And first off, I have great respect because that's where I broke in is my broadcasting career. I missed you by five, six years. Jack Maul oh, wow. was my manager in 1993 in Clinton. I was there for four seasons. So when I saw you there in 87 and 88, mad respect for you because Clinton is not an easy uh, city to survive as far as baseball goes. But you again, you've seen the evolution though of of player development and of philosophies from organization to organization. The Rays have always been cutting edge, but what what was the philosophy of developing players back in the mid to late 80s versus 10 or 11 years later when the Rays came into existence? Well, back in the day, we always thought pitchers needed to throw, pitch, uh, at least have, you know, two, three, 400 innings under their belts. Players used to have 1,500 at-bats before they were major league ready. Um, and, and we always incorporated that in, in rather than moving guys from one level to the next, if, if they were having a successful season in the first half, we would let them continue. And then the following year in spring training, then we knew they were ready for the next level. Um, the, the transfer of players for the younger guys was much more difficult back in the day. Um, as opposed the older players, they would move, you know, according to how successful they were and plus how the big league team would need them. Um, but you know, the, the, the younger player 
would always say, why is this guy going to the big leagues? Why aren't I? <laughs> and then you'd have to take out the player development and say, well, mm -hmm. you're still struggling hitting the breaking ball. You're not recognizing up and down, things like that. So um, pitching wise, your secondary pitches are not where they need to be to get to the big leagues. Um, but it was all a process that um, I think worked very well at that time. Um, now it's different which is okay. Um, baseball's transitioned, you know, mm -hmm. into different aspects. Um, but I think everything is circular. It'll all come back to that point um, in that, um, you know, we're going to try to impact baseballs, hit, not lift the ball, um, you know, and, and elevate your fastball as well as pitch down with your fastball in and out. Um, but your secondary pitches right now are, are the strikeout pitches, and that's what people see. Um, they see home runs. They see strikeouts, um, you know, and pitchers now, you know, solid six innings. And, you know, it's really transitioned into middle relievers, closers, mm -hmm. setup guys. Um, so it's all transitioned like that. But all in all, the game is really moving forward. Um, as you see with bigger bases, now trying to incorporate the things to where the fans get excited. It's more exciting to them. Um, and the analytics have played a good, good part of that, mm -hmm. um, which I'm all for that, um, as long as it's going to make your team better and you can use it in the right respect. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. Uh, a lot of fans, I'm <clears throat> sure, are, are really interested to hear about some of the players, some of the guys you were teammates with, some of the players that you managed, and certainly at the top of that list uh, has to be Derek Jeter from uh, from Greensboro in 1993. Uh, I had the great opportunity. I, I've never met the captain. I've never met Derek, but I met his soccer coach when he was a young kid in Kalamazoo named Stephen Trivers. And when Stephen wow. told me about Derek Jeter, as Derek was in the middle of his career with the New York Yankees, he would always tell me that he referred to Stephen Trivers always as Mr. Trivers. On the soccer field, he referred to all of his coaches as Mr. whatever the coach's name was, but he was always Mr. Trivers. He came up through a, a, evidently a phenomenal family, just respected the game, respected his elders, respected the people uh, who taught him. What what do you remember about that that side of Derek Jeter and what was he like to manage because you had him when he was what 19 in his first full season yes so as you as you state he was very respectful to this day he still calls Joe Torrey Mr. Torrey um you know and I think that all transpires from his family his mom and his dad um and his sister um he has great respect for for everybody that tries to help him um, he's very guarded in who he hangs around with to allow him to focus on what he needs to focus. But he was a special cat in that um, very, very, very aware of what was going on. Mm. Uh, quick story. Um, when he was a rookie, um, he was hitting below 200. And on the last day of the season, actually got two hits to hit over the Mendoza line. So, and there was times when he was 18, like any 18 year old, they get homesick and, and that's probably the first time they've been away from home and they want to go home and, and call it a day. But his dad and mom were so supportive of him that um, he, he just kept grinding and grinding. And in the process, he understood about how to get better. Um, one of the things that I really attribute to him is he went to instruction league one year with us and it, with the Yankees and was not allowed to swing the bat. He only worked on his fielding after that Greensboro year where he, where he made 56 errors. Um, he came to, to uh, instructional league and worked on fielding, fielding, fielding. And the next year cut those 56 errors in, in half in the Florida state league and was named the Florida state league player of the year and just propelled his career forward. Um, I was fortunate to manage him at every level, at A, double A, and triple A, mm -hmm. and especially giving him the news of going to the big leagues yeah. was very, very rewarding. How did you? Pardon? Uh, how, how did you tell Derek he was going to the big leagues for the first time? 
Well, the first time was when Tony Fernandez got hurt. He was just going up there for a short time. So I told him, you know, and the organization told me he was going to go up there until Tony, Tony got better. Um, so he went up for, I don't know, I don't know how long, but when he came back, it was like, that was a lot of fun. I want to get back there. So he worked that much harder. And then it's, you know, in yeah. September went back up and, and, and finished up the year. And the next year was like, I'm going to take this job. And, and that's what he did. You know, he, he was a determined individual and he's one of a kind. I'll tell you, he, he is a true, true, professional and very respectful and one of the best guys I, I had the fortunate to manage. Did anything about his storied career surprise you? Just how, how quick he made the transition defensively from that one year to the next. Um, and plus sticking with his process of hitting and how, how that grew and his ability to use the whole field and, and adjust at a big league level when guys started to pitch him away and, and being able to turn on the ball and the recognition of that mm -hmm. um, is just amazing that somebody that young can do that. Hmm. So I want to bring you to a, a different story and a different person. You probably didn't anticipate me bring it up during during this podcast, but uh, 1999 was my first year in double A. I'm working with the Carolina Mudcats in the Southern League. And we're hosting the Orlando Rays. And there's a left-handed pitcher that comes in out of the bullpen with just a number on his back. And he's not even on the, the facsimile roster that we have in the press box. Nobody knows who he is, where he's from. Uh, found out what his name was. He pitched against us. And then the next day, I go into the outfield during batting practice with, with Orlando. And he's long tossing with, with one of his uh, relievers. And found out his name was Jim Morris. And found a little bit of information about who he was and where he came from because we had, I was scouring the Korean leagues. And this is back in 99. You couldn't find a lot of information on the internet, but I'm looking everywhere to find out who's this Jim Morris guy, where'd he come from? Nobody knew anything. So I got a little bit of information from him, but I had I broadcast his, for, well, his game against the Mudcats that previous night. He gets to Durham with you a, a couple of weeks later. And now people are beginning to kind of understand a little bit about his story. And wh why, do you, why do you pick it up from there for the several weeks you had Jim Morris ultimately getting to the point where you're telling now this guy who's been out of baseball for a decade that he's going to the big leagues for the first time as a 35-year-old? Well, it's, it's a truly an amazing story that uh, his, he was coaching and teaching in Texas and um, – he had the baseball team and they challenged him to go ahead and start throwing because he was throwing hard. And fortunately there was a devil ray scout that saw him and, you know, gave him an opportunity and he flew with it through the organization because you had to at that age. Mm -hmm. um, when he came to me in AAA, it was, you know, just put him in situations that are difficult and see how he can, can manage to get through them. And it was a phenomenal situation in that he prospered. And, you know, that was the first time, you know, you would see guys throw 96, 98. And at that, at 35 was like, holy cow, this guy's incredible. So, you know, being the infancy of the devil rays, you know, there was, it was a win-win situation and, and he got the opportunity and took it. How do you remember the the Devil Rays telling you that he was going to be called up? And then how did you tell the rookie? Well, you know, um, I got the call from Chuck Lamar. And uh, like I did with all the players, I'd bring him in the office. And, um, you know, I, I said, uh, Jim, you are just got a call from Chuck Lamar. And we would like to bring you to the big leagues. Well, you know, it was almost like he broke down. And, and from what I remember after telling him when he went out in the clubhouse, he got a standing ovation by his teammates and then, you know, went to the big leagues, which was pretty awesome. And that the respect of, of your peers, your fellow players 
that they would actually clap for you mm. and wish you the best when you go to the big leagues. Uh, visiting here with Bill Evers. Bill, we have just a couple of minutes left. What, what, what one, two, three memories do you have of managing here in Durham? You won back-to-back -back Governor's Cubs. Was it something from those playoff games? Was there another moment or another, uh, uh, another game or something that you recall when you think of your time managing the Durham Bulls? What comes to mind for you? Well, one of the most rewarding times was when um, we won the championship. And I think it was in 02 where they took Travis Harper, Dan Wheeler, Ozzie Timmons, Steve Cox to the big leagues and left us with all the little guys and <laughs> no more power and no more. And we actually went through, I don't think we lost a game in the playoffs and in the championship series and winning the championship led by um, a little guy with a ton of uh, energy by the name of Ryan Friel, mm -hmm. who, who just led us to, to, to the ultimate championship and may you rest in peace that mm -hmm. um, that was one of the biggest things that I remember uh, about that club that you know, we, we had such a great season and then four of our best guys go to the big leagues right before the playoffs. And it's like, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, I don't know if I had one of my best speeches then, but what, whatever happened, happened. And, and it was a very rewarding season in that we were able to do that. Uh, what, what a fantastic story. And, and Durham still <laughs> thinks of those of those days and uh, you know, has the trophies and the rings uh, shining very proudly on, on hands all over the staff here in Durham. Uh, I, I don't think I know the answer to this question, but why number 20? How did number 20 become Bill Evers' number? Good point. I have no idea. Maybe that was the only one that was the only one that was left in Durham. Because <laughs> because when I played, I wore number 13. And mm -hmm. in college, I wore 13. Mm -hmm. But 20 happened to be what was on my back. Um mm -hmm. I know I wore 25 at one time and Charlie was 25. So I was given 20 and it worked out well. Um, and Charlie did a great job after me. So um, I don't know. I have no idea why I got number 20. <laughs> so so if, if baseball didn't work out, you know, you came from New York city, went down to Eckerd college down in Florida, you were a, what, a, a management major down there. What, yes. what, what would have been, the career path for Bill Evers if the Cubs had not have come calling in 76? I probably would have been some kind of teacher of at school and, and coached some high school stuff and, and hopefully transitioned into getting a job at a college level or something like that. Uh, but I think teaching was part of what I really wanted to do. I can remember my mom telling me when I was little in the crib, I would have a ball and a bat in the crib that was a Nerf ball and a Nerf bat. Um, and from the time I can remember, I was, you know, infatuated with baseball. And and I was fortunate enough through us moving from New York City out to Long Island and, and playing in Little League on, on Long Island. And as a 12-year-old, I got to play on a traveling team that went from Long Island to Chicago for a month of August where we played 29 games in 30 days and had host families and things like that. Um, and, and then, you know, I was just fortunate in playing with some older guys who, who I played on a Stam usual team as a 16 year old with 18 and 21 year olds. And one of the guys on that team told coach Livesey, who was at Brown um, that you know, I might be able to play at Brown. So I was going to go to Brown and then coach Livesey left to Eckerd and I, I followed him there. So, but if it wasn't for the guy who was telling him who played for coach Livesey at Brown about me, I don't know if I would have ever been able to find my way to Eckerd. Um, I probably would have went to school in somewhere in New York, not where there's a whole lot of scouts. I was never <laughs> that guy that had, outstanding outstanding tools but I could play the game and I played a position that you know people would see you catching and playing some yeah. first and I could swing it a little bit so but it's amazing how yeah. things transpired through the course of all these years and and to this day I still talk with coach Livesey probably 
every two weeks mm -hmm. and very grateful all the people that have helped me along the way. Yeah, I have a hunch the game would have found you anyway. So uh, the final 30 seconds we have here, Bill, I'd be awfully remiss if I didn't ask about your wife of 42 years, Patty. Can you sum up quickly just exactly what she has meant to you on this baseball journey as a family? Well, just to let you know, our first 10 years of marriage, we did not own a home. So we moved 30 times. In those 30 times, she was with me from the winter. We would go to spring training, spring training to the affiliate and back to wherever we were going to live. Um, there was many times where paychecks were late and we were scrambling, but through the course of her support and allowing me to do what I love to do. Um, without her, I don't think this would have been possible. Um, you know, and, and in respect, um, the kids, they went to school in six different states. Uh, they all have their master's degrees, the two of them. And I, I couldn't be more proud of what Patty did raising them when I was gone. Mm -hmm. um, and w one other respect I'd like to thank um, Mr. Goodman for all he did for my family and myself and for Mike Burling being there day in and day out and listening to, to me as far as my gripes and this and that. And Mike was a, a sounding board and was a great leader for the Durham Bulls. And, and I really appreciate everything that everybody's done for me. Well, we are eternally grateful for you and being a member of the Durham Bulls family and everything that you represented and uh, and, and brought to the city of Durham and, and the, the, the Durham Bulls itself. Can't thank you enough for spending some time with us, Bill. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Hopefully I'm going to bring the grandkids this this uh, summer and make a drop and so they can see all this. I Thank will you. say on, on one of our first podcasts, we sat down with Charlie Montelli. He said he would like to do a podcast with you at some point later on this summer. So hopefully you'll be up for something like that too. Yeah, we can do it for all sure. Right. All right. Hey, Whatever uh, you hit, need. hit him straight down the fairways and uh, enjoy time with the kids and the grandkids. Thanks again, Bill. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate right. it. So that is going to wrap things up for the Durham Bulls podcast. Again, you can subscribe on Apple and on Spotify. And you can watch this very podcast on our YouTube page, The Durham Bulls Podcast. Subscribe to that and you'll get notifications every time that a new show drops. So for the Hall of Fame manager of the Durham Bulls, Bill Evers, and everyone behind the scenes, Patrick Keene is saying thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and we'll catch you again next week on The Durham Bulls Podcast.